Welcome to the Holy Land and this biblical site of Gibeon. Now this high place of Gibeon is mentioned 43 times in the Bible and played a major role in the history of Israel. Here are just a few key events that happened here. This ancient city is named after the Gibeonites who tricked Joshua into making a treaty with them after the Israelites entered the Promised Land. Just above the city of Gibeon was this key high place that was used for worship during much of Israel's history. The amazing miracle of the sun and moon standing still as a result of Joshua's prayer happened at this high place or in this area of Gibeon. Gibeon, also known as Gibeah, was the hometown of King Saul. The tabernacle resided at the high place of Gibeon during the reigns of David and Solomon. Soon after Solomon became king, he went to Gibeon, where he received supernatural wisdom, wealth, and power to use for ruling God's people. Today, there is a synagogue and mosque here that was built upon the ruins of a crusader church, which was built on the ruins of a Byzantine church, which was built on the ruins where the tabernacle was once located during the reigns of King David and King Solomon. And a tradition dating back to the Byzantine period places the tomb of Samuel here as well. So as you can see, this place had a lot of key events that happened, and we're gonna be looking at those in this video. So at this biblical site, we'll be looking at the location of this place and why that's so important. We'll talk about the historical background of this location. We'll be looking at some of the amazing places of interest at this site. We'll see the key events in the Bible that took place here and we'll end with the faith lesson in order to learn the major lessons God desires for us from this important biblical site. So I think you'll find this video very enlightening and transforming to your life. So it moves my heart to think I'm in the place where the tabernacle resided for many years, where Solomon was here, where David was here, where the Lord appeared to Solomon and gave him great wisdom and wealth Amazing to be in this place. It's a real privilege. Now Gibeon is located about six miles or 10 kilometers northwest of Jerusalem. Today it's known as Nabi Samuel or Nebi Samuel, which means the prophet Samuel, because it's believed Samuel's tomb is located here. Just below this high place and to the north is the ancient city of Gibeon with its ruins, known today as Al-Jib. Gibeon is on top of a mountain with a spectacular view of Jerusalem and the surrounding area. In fact, you can see Jerusalem quite easily from this site. Here's a look at Gibeon taken from the Mount of Olives. It becomes clear that this spot was a significant high place and fits the biblical descriptions of many events found in scripture and history. This high place is about 3,000 feet or 908 meters above sea level. It's also located on an ancient route that led from the coastal plain of Israel through Bet Haron to this high place of Gibeon and then on to Jerusalem. Today, highways 436 and 443 mark this ancient route. Now let's look at some historical background of this key site. Before the conquest of the Israelites, Gibeon was a Canaanite city. Gibeon was a popular place in the Bible and it's mentioned 43 times. Its name means hill city and it's located in the heart of the tribe of Benjamin. It was a high place of worship throughout much of Israel's history and the tabernacle was here during the times of King David and King Solomon. The tomb of the prophet Samuel is believed to be located inside the synagogue part of this building. Excavations, which are still ongoing, have uncovered the remains of settlements from both the first temple, which is around 700 BC, and second temple during the Hasmonean period, which ran from about 167 to 63 BC, can be found here. During the Byzantine period in around 400 AD, a church and monastery were built at this high place of Gibeon. 
Also in the Byzantine period, Christian tradition said that the prophet's bones were relocated here and a monastery was built at the site to honor Samuel. Now some would say that Samuel was buried here to begin with because the town was named Rama. Others say that his bones were relocated here. We really don't know for certain. Then the Crusaders built a church and fortress over the monastery in the 12th century AD. The main structure that can be seen today is a magnificent Crusader era church and it's one of only four that survived after the Muslim conquest of the Crusaders. It survived because the Muslims turned this church into a mosque and they still use it today. After Saladin conquered much of Israel in 1187 AD, the church and monastery were damaged. In 1267, the Mamluks captured the area and controlled the Holy Land until 1517. In the 14th century, the Mamluks converted the church into a mosque. Remains from this period include two ceramic ovens near the stables. Because it's believed the prophet Samuel was buried here, along with the biblical history of the site, in the 15th century, Jews built a synagogue adjacent to the mosque and resumed pilgrimages to this site. It appears that later on, the mosque was renovated by the Ottomans in 1730. The building that we see today was rebuilt by the British after World War I. Both the mosque and the synagogue share the same building. Now let's take a look around and see some of the key places of interest at this site. It's quite amazing all that can be found here. The first we'll look at is the location of the original tabernacle. It's believed to be directly under this synagogue and mosque. This would make sense as we have a long history of one thing built on top of another, which in archaeology is a strong sign of authenticity. As mentioned earlier, this synagogue and mosque was built upon the ruins of a Crusader church, which was built on the ruins of a Byzantine church, which is built upon where the tabernacle was located during the reigns of King David and King Solomon. It also has other ancient ruins dating back to the first temple period of around the 7th century BC. So in archaeology and these key sites, one of the things that gives authenticity is one thing built upon another, upon another, upon another, going way back. So this place here has had significant events happen here which gives it authenticity that it is the place where the tabernacle was and all of these events took place. Now just down the hill from these ruins is a place called Hannah's Spring. It is named after Samuel's mother, Hannah, who is believed to have traversed this area and lived close by. Today, women come here to pray for God's blessing for conception and childbirth. An ancient road passing through an orchard of strawberry, olive, and fig trees leads to a small spring flowing from a cave. So this is the area of Hannah's Spring. Above Hannah's Spring, entrances to first temple period burial caves can be seen. Now, during extensive archaeological excavations here, archaeologists found remains dating to the Hasmonean period, which was from around 164 to 63 BC. And we can see a number of well-preserved two-story houses and then streets in this section. During the Byzantine period, in around 400 AD, a large monastery was constructed at this site. There are few remains from that period since the Crusaders built their church and fortress over the Byzantine monastery. The monastery served as a hostel for the Christian pilgrims who came to visit Jerusalem. It existed until around 900 AD. Later, the crusade to liberate the Holy Land and free Jerusalem started in 1096 AD. On June 7th, 1099, three years after the military expedition started in Europe, the Crusaders finally approached the gates of Jerusalem. 
They first arrived at the site of Nebi Samuel here, where they could see Jerusalem in the distance. They were so joyful on viewing the holy city for the first time that they later named this site as the Mountain of Joy. In 1140, the Crusaders upgraded this site to a military fortress and as a holy shrine. They cut into the bedrock on the west, north, and east sides, thus creating a defensive moat. However, only part of the moat was finished. The hewn rocks were used for the building material for the Church of St. Samuel on the top of the hill. The church was finished in 1157 A.D. The fortress was a rectangular structure with the church at its center over the traditional tomb of the prophet Samuel. On the north and northeast side, the crusaders cut away the bedrock to around 15 feet or five meters below the surface. The stones were used to build their structures and fortress. This large flat area was then used as a campsite for armies and as a hostel for Christian pilgrims going to Jerusalem. On the north side, within the quarried area, are a number of hewn structures. We can see a large stable with rock-cut troughs. There are also pools, cistern, rock-hewn tombs, and agricultural installations here as well. An earlier synagogue was preserved underground where the actual tomb is located. Entrance to the synagogue is on the north side and houses the believed tomb of the prophet Samuel. There is a women's section and a men's section to this synagogue. The men's section is accessed by going down some stairs and is where the tomb of Samuel is located. Now it's located at this lower level because it's the level of the original Byzantine church and monastery that existed here even up to the 9th century AD. Entrance to the mosque is on the east side. On top of the mosque and synagogue is a large viewing area that provides a spectacular view of the area. You can see Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, and many other sites from this high place here. Now let's look at some key events that happened in the Bible right here in Gibeon. Now this ancient city is mentioned after the Gibeonites who tricked Joshua into making a treaty with them. The Gibeonites succeeded in the treaty because Joshua failed to inquire of the Lord about them. The old city is located here below, as you can see. So in Joshua 9 it says, When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they also acted craftily and set out as envoys, and took worn-out socks on their donkeys, and wineskins worn out, torn and mended, and worn out and patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes on themselves. And all the bread of their provision was dry and had become crumbled. They went to Joshua to the camp of Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. The men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you are living within our land. How then shall we make a covenant with you? And so, as we know, Joshua does make a covenant with them because they tricked him. And the reason they tricked him was because Joshua did not inquire of the Lord and pray to God for direction in this matter. And as mentioned, the amazing miracle of the sun standing still happened right here in Gibeon. It says in Joshua 10, Now it came about when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and had utterly destroyed it, just as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made a peace treaty with Israel and were in their land, then he feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. Therefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent word to Hoam, king of Hebron, and to Piram, king of Harmuth, and to Jephiah, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, 
Come up to me and help me, and let us attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the sons of Israel. So the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Harmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up with all their armies and camped by Gibeon and fought against it. So just below here is where all these armies gathered together to fight against Joshua because they had heard what Joshua had done. So they all made an alliance and were going to unify so that they could wipe out the Israelites. But God does an amazing thing. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So they were saying, we made peace with you. Now it's your responsibility to defend us. So the people of Gibeon sent to Joshua and said, please come help us because all these kings are gathered to wipe us out because we've made a peace treaty with you. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the valiant warriors. The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal. And the Lord confounded them before Israel and he slew them, talking about all these kings, with a great slaughter at Gibeon and pursued them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Aska and Makeda and they fled from before Israel. While they were at the descent of Ben Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Aska, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with the sword. So God sent these hailstones down upon these kings and wiped more out by these hailstones than Joshua did with his army. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, now this is amazing, this is where he prays. And Joshua said, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ahilon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. It is not written in the book of Hosher, it says, and the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like it before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So can you just imagine it was right here where the sun stopped. Now that is a miraculous, astounding miracle that God did. And he listened to Joshua. Now Gibeon, also known as Gibeah, was the hometown of King Saul. It says in 1 Samuel 10, 26, Saul also went to his house at Gibeah. Tradition affirms, and it's also believed by some, that this place is the biblical Mizpah, which in Hebrew means tower, where Samuel anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel says in 1 Samuel 10, 17. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. Then in verse 24 it says, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him, referring to Saul, whom the Lord has chosen? Surely there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. According to scripture, Samuel died and was buried in a place called Ramah which was the hometown of the prophet. In 1 Samuel 25, 1, it says, Then Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him at his house in Ramah. The location of Ramah is not known, but according to its meaning in Hebrew, which means heights, it should be on a high hill in an area close by to Jerusalem. This area certainly fits this description but we're not totally certain. And it was at Gibeon that the tabernacle was set up during the reigns of David and Solomon. So it was in Shiloh for some time, and then it was moved closer to Jerusalem when David became king. And then later on, Solomon moved the tabernacle, then incorporated it with the new temple that he built in Jerusalem. 
It says in 1 Chronicles 21, 28, At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he offered sacrifice there for the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offering were in the high place of Gibeon at that time. So right here is where the tabernacle was. And it says in 2 Chronicles 1, Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and to the judges and to every leader in all Israel, the heads of the fathers' households. Then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place which was at Gibeon, for God's tent of meeting was there, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. So once again, this just confirms that the tabernacle was here that Moses made. It resided here at this high place in Gibeon. So can you just imagine, as we look around and show you these places, that right here is where the tabernacle was. Now soon after Solomon came to the throne, he paid a visit here to Gibeon to offer sacrifices. It says in 1 Kings 3, Now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Here we can see that God did not desire that they worshiped on the high places. They were to worship at the tabernacle, not just anywhere. So Solomon loved the Lord, but he erred in this way. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. In response, God not only gave him supernatural wisdom, but wealth and power as well. So it was right here that the Lord appeared to Solomon and gave him great wisdom and great wealth. So just imagine the Lord appearing to Solomon right here. And then as Solomon went on to write, of course, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, a man of great wisdom. Now after Solomon built the temple, all the men of Israel assembled themselves here in Gibeon, and they took their things of the tabernacle and incorporated it and moved it to the temple that Solomon had built. Now what are some lessons and some observations that we can learn from this amazing place of Gibeon where the sun stood still and many amazing miracles took place? The first faith lesson that we can learn from this site is that the Gibeonites tricked Joshua into making an agreement with them because he failed to seek the Lord in prayer and ask God's directions. What about us? Do we make poor decisions as well because we fail to seek the Lord? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight or he will direct your paths. So in all of our ways, we should acknowledge the Lord and not overpass or bypass God's wisdom and direction for us. If we do, we will have failure and have problems like Joshua did with the Gibeonites. They were an issue for him and all Israel throughout their history in the promised land. The second faith lesson is that God heard Joshua's prayer and the sun and moon stood still here for a day. There is nothing we can ask in prayer that is too big for God to answer. In fact, in James 5, 16 through 18, it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man or person can accomplish much. And then it uses the example of Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So we have these uh, times wherein people pray, and God answers, and in James 5, God uses Elijah's prayer as an encouragement to us, saying that Elijah was like us in every way, yet he prayed, and God answered his prayer, and it didn't rain. So in the same way, we should believe that God can answer our prayers. So do we believe that God truly hears our prayers? Now, he's not always going to answer them as we think he should, but God certainly hears us, 
and he does attend to our prayers. The third faith lesson is that God punished the Israelites later on because they broke their agreement with the Gibeonites that Joshua had made with them. In Psalm 15, 4 it says, But he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, or he who keeps his word to his own hurt. Even though it might cost us something, we are people of our word. We are people of our agreements. Our yeses are yeses, our noes are noes. We don't just break faith, we don't just change because it might be good for us. We keep our word even if it hurts us. And then the last faith lesson is that God gave Solomon supernatural wisdom, wealth, and power to serve others and glorify God. So Solomon prayed for wisdom to lead God's people and God delighted in that and gave him wisdom and he also gave him wealth and power. So what about us? Do we use our wisdom, wealth, and power for the Lord? Do we mainly use it in serving God or do we primarily use it for our own benefit. But God delights when we pray for wisdom and direction to serve Him and others. Wisdom to serve our families, to be good leaders in our families, in our churches, to be good examples among the non-believers and others. So we should pray, we should ask God for wisdom, and God will answer us so that we can use our wisdom, our power, and even our wealth to serve God and His kingdom. So it's really special to be here and to think about all of the things and to reflect upon the amazing things that took place here and think of Joshua and the Gibeonites and Joshua praying and the sun standing still and, and the, the high place being here and God appearing to Solomon and of course David being here and the tabernacle uh, being here for many years. So very, very special uh, to be here and to think about these things. So anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Uh, thank you for watching and God bless.